Well, if you're watching this, it's because you're watching our online worship experience at the beginning or during the week of the Big Surf. This is a different sort of week, obviously. Normally you'd click on the link and it would take you through to maybe a, a screen where it says, we'll start in a few minutes, or maybe it's already going and there's people singing and playing on this stage, leading in worship, and instead you're getting me. That is because this week we are not involving any volunteers across any of our campuses. Everything is being done by staff members. And for us to have a service that is recorded and then sent and cut and, you know, all those things involved, it, we required volunteers. This is actually being shot ahead of time so that we don't involve any volunteers. See, we're doing that. We're intentionally inconveniencing ourselves and to some degree you because we don't want people serving inside of our walls this week. We want people getting outside of our walls. I mean, many of you have signed up for the Big Serve already, and for the, we, we appreciate that. Some of you are going to serve outside of our walls this week, and you haven't signed up, and we appreciate that too. And some of you, it didn't work out. For whatever reason, you couldn't do partake, and, and that's okay too. But the point remains is that this week we didn't want people serving inside of our walls. We want them serving outside of our walls, serving their neighbor, not maybe you know, holding the door for people here or whatever. But with that in mind, I want to start with a question. If you tried to accomplish with your life, if you were Jesus, and during your life, and he lived for about 32 years, you wanted to accomplish what he did to begin a movement, to give people hope, set people free, to gain followers so, who, who believed in what your message and what you represented and what you tried to accomplish so deeply that they're going to invest their life into it and who would then create other followers who would do the exact same thing. And yet we know what he did on the cross, and we're not really including that in this little hypothetical, but if you wanted to begin the movement he started, how would you approach that? Chances are you wouldn't be born in a, you know, nowhere, one stoplight, town like Bethlehem to a, a few nobodies who no one knew at a time when, you know, it was harder to get messages out there. You had, it was literally only word of mouth. And you probably wouldn't live in a place called Nazareth. At one point in the Bible, someone even says, he's from Nazareth? Does anything good ever come out of Nazareth? If that were me, if I had to start a movement, I might have actually started it today, now, in the internet age. And I wouldn't have been born to a nobody in a, you know, in a stable, laid in a manger. You know, that probably wouldn't have been my strategy at all. Like, if that were me, and I wanted to get as many eyes as possible, and I wanted to get as many followers as possible, I, if I were him, I probably would have, like, lowered down to earth from heaven at the 50-yard line halfway through the Super Bowl, at, like, halftime. You know, somebody's up there singing and dancing, and I would have like lowered down from heaven in the midst and said, I am Jesus. You should now follow me. I've got a movement. It's great. It's going to be the best. Follow me. But that's not what he did. It came long before the internet age, obviously. Humble beginnings. Seemingly patient, slow process. He didn't want lots and lots of people to follow him. Actually, when lots and lots of people were following him around, he would scare them off by saying things like, eat my flesh and drink my blood. He would tell them, unless you hate your mother, hate your father, you can't be my disciple. These things they didn't really understand at first, but maybe creeped them out, and they're like, all right, I'm not going to follow that weirdo. He had a very, very different ministry philosophy. There's this book, called The Patient Ferment of the Early Church by a guy named Alan Kreider. And this is like a life's work type book by Alan Kreider. And in it, he talks about the way that the early church was formed. He said that it was this patient ferment. And in that, he meant that there was a rhythm of worship, a rhythm of community. They did this thing called catechism, which is basically teaching in a way that people will like, remember what they're learning, and that they served one another, both meals, but also in each other's homes and the, 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 their you know, countrymen at large. That they were deeply committed to service, to community, 
to learning and to worship. And this deep investment, this slow, patient investment, he calls a fermentation. Now, if you know anything about, you know, like there's fermentation in wine or bread or kombucha, if you're into that, which I don't know why you would be, uh, or in beer, there's fermentation. And fermentation is any process in which the activity of microorganisms bring about a desirable change to a food or beverage. And I get why he used the word fermentation. Any activity of a microorganism bringing about a desirable change. And I see an individual over here committed to teaching and worship and meals together and service. And an individual over here committed to teaching and worship and service and meals together and prayer. And these microorganisms all over the Roman Empire patiently fermenting those around them, creating these desirable changes. It was this life-on-life, life, humble, slow, small, faithful reality. Eugene Peterson, in his book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, says it like this, There is a great market for religious experience in our world. There is little enthusiasm, enthusiasm for the patient acquisition of virtue. Little inclination to sign up for a long apprenticeship in what earlier generations of Christians called holiness. With this in mind, and you think back on how Jesus did what he did, he invited a few people, maybe a couple dozen, to follow him around, to fund his ministry, to learn from him, to lead as he led because they learned what he, how he lived. And then this slow, patient, small fermentation became this massive duplication, re, reproduction of people deeply committed to him. And you're like, man, how did he do that? This is an incredible church growth, growth philosophy. But how did he instill such, in such meaningful ways? You know, his message was new. It was this new message of hope. He was deeply faithful. He balanced really well this idea of being in and with the Father and then doing for the Father. But he also did things for those followers of his, which was out of left field, unbelievable, would have made an obvious and dramatic wrinkle in their brain on a new way to live. This was, this was countercultural and subversive. I'm going to read about one of those in John 13. I'm going to read the whole passage and then we'll talk through it. John 13, starting in verse 1. It was just before Passover festival that Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. We're going to keep reading, but that's such an emotive, intimate verse. Having loved his own, he loved them till the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompt, prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, 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 no. You will never wash my feet. Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head and my elbows and my shoulders and my knees and my shins, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. It's like, hey, dude, I'm not giving you a bath right now, okay? <laughs> their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. So you, Peter, not every one of you, my disciples. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was, and that was why he said not every one of them was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, returned to his place, 
He said, he said, do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, am, now that I your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. This is one of those passages that in some regard is incredibly familiar. If you spent any time in church, you've probably heard the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. It's incredibly familiar and incredibly foreign to us simultaneously because we don't really have an equivalent for washing feet. I don't want to list some like lowly job because I don't think that's an equivalent for washing feet. doesn't matter how lowly you think your job is, there is dignity in working hard and making money and providing. Like that, there is dignity there. I'm not gonna, so I'm not going dis, to uh, you know, discredit whatever it is you do if you think it's lowly by saying, oh, it's like washing feet. So you can say like serving your family in some lowly way, but it's not the same. Actually, rabbis who were contemporaries of Jesus said that if, so, if a household has Jewish servants and non-Jewish servants, that you should always make a non-Jewish person wash feet because it's so undignified. You don't want a Jewish person having to do that. Have some other race of people wash feet because it's just like that lowly. You don't want to like, uh, you know, devalue someone so lowly if they're, if they're Jewish. So we're, we don't really have a one-to-one equivalent of washing feet. But what we do know is that it was probably pretty gross. You know, these people wore sandals and walked around on dirty roads. It was incredibly lowly. It wasn't a job that you would volunteer for, usually. And that it normally happened before you entered a home, like at the doorway, at the threshold of the home. Someone would be there to wash feet, and then they would enter, and then their feet would be washed. That's a, that is a, a service provided by a home, a respectable home in that time. What Jesus did was very, very similar and very, very different. They were already in the home. They were in this upper room. And it wasn't done by a stranger to strangers or the lowest servant to higher up people. He was washing the feet of some of his best friends in the world. This was an incredibly more than humble, lowly act but definitely humble. It was also a very intimate act. He was setting an example for his friends on how his friends should operate, how they should live their lives. He did what he did in spite of a few things. He did it in spite of who he was. It says at the beginning, it says he he knew he was about to return to his father. Well, so he understands that he's not just any other person but you know, he is the creator and sustainer of the world. So in spite of the fact of who he was, this is what he did. In spite of the fact of who they were, the people whose feet were being washed. You know, he says at one point, you know, yes, you do not need to be clean, but some of you do. And it's referring to Judas. He knew that Judas was going to betray him, and he still washed Judas' feet. Even someone like Peter, who the, you know, the next day, they, they hear... They go out to the garden. They, they, he asks them to pray with him. They fall asleep. He wakes them up, says, hey, man, would you pray with me? They fall asleep again. The next day, he's going through this process, and Peter denies him. This same Peter is like, all right, well, wash my head and my elbows and my knees. Like, never, I would never let you wash my feet. A very short window later, he's, I don't know who that guy is. And still, Jesus washed his feet. So he washed their feet in spite of who he was. He washed their feet in spite of who they were. And he washed their feet in spite of what he was about to do. I can be honest and say that if I'm about to come up here and do this, right, in front of people, I get into a different mindset. You know, I, you know, I, it's a li- I'm not going to have my most meaningful conversations just before. And sometimes people you know, try and have a conversation with me about, you know, my life or this or that right before I go on stage and, and but it's always hard, you know, it, you never have the most meaningful conversations because you're trying to get your head on for what you're about to do and, and be ready for that. I can only imagine, and by the way, like, like the night before I go to the dentist, man, it's a little stressful. I hate the dentist. I have a great dentist and I still hate going, right? So it is, you know, it's because it's, it's what I'm about to have to go through. 
if the dentist the next morning can throw me off, I can only imagine how distracted he was, how his mindset was somewhere else in this moment. So in spite of who he was, in spite of who they were, in spite of what he was going to do, he washed their feet. And we are about to, because this is the big serve week, we're about to go out there and serve. Not all of us are, but many of us. And by the way, there are probably some still jobs that are still available when you're watching this. You could probably sign up and, and still serve if you'd like. But, in spite, but we're about to go out and serve. And honestly, like even if you're not serving the big serve, anytime you leave your home, you represent Jesus. If, you're, if your circles of influence are you're hanging out with people, your friends, and they know you're a follower of Jesus, then you represent him to those people. If the people in your workplace know you love Jesus, they, you represent him to the people in your workplace. So in spite of what we are here to do, we do these things despite who he is. And by that I mean, we, when we leave our home, we represent him. That is a awe-inspiring jaw-dropping responsibility to leave when you leave your door in the morning you represent Jesus because that's something that as a staff you know we pray together on Tuesday mornings and that's something that I will oftentimes in, my, in that environment pray around man I cannot believe we are floored that you would choose us to represent you to this group of people who call Crossway home that is a high and holy calling and for that we are Floored, and we thank you. But that's not just us and staff. Like what the Bible say, you are a nation of priests. All of us represent Jesus when we leave our homes. And so what we do, what we're about to do, in spite of who he is, and we don't deserve to represent him. We do what we are about to do, not because of what we're about to accomplish. Like, we're going to go out there, and, you know, I'm, I, I'm serving at Share uh, Sunday the 3rd, which is a ministry in, in Milford, and we're like scraping paint off of a wall and repainting it. And there's a, a, there's a community garden that's overgrown, and we're going to cut back the weeds so that it, peop, so under-resourced families can grow food for their table in that space that we're going to prepare uh, this weekend. So those are good things, but it's not like movement starting things. I mean, yes, we're going you know, to record it and tell the story, and it's going to be great. At the same time, you know, they're not going to, you know, songwriters aren't going to write songs about what we do at Share. It's going to be great. It's going to be meaningful, but it's not going to change the world. And yet, we're going to be faithful in the small ways. Like we talked about earlier, you know, the long obedience in the same direction, that, sl that slow, small, faithful movement that these that this early church did, these microorganisms bringing about a desirable change. We're going to be fermenting our neighborhoods and our towns. And we're going to go out and do what we're going to do in spite of who we are. You know, we don't know the background for many of, the, to detail, the many of the disciples who were in that room. We know Peter. We know Judas. We know James and John were a bit, you know, impetuous. We know Thomas doubted that one time. By the way, he doubted like one time, and ever since then he's like doubting Thomas. Like that is like, <laughs> that is a bad rap that dude got. So we know little details here and there, but we know our laundry, and still God calls on us to represent him. So in spite of who we are, in spite of who he is, in spite of what it is we're offering him in service this week, He's going to be with us. He's going to be in us. We're going to be representing him. And that is a beautiful, high, and holy calling. You know, a little bit later in the same book, in the book of John, John 21, 25 says this, Jesus also did many other things. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. And that's a little, like, over the top, because he did ministry for like two years. You can record literally everything someone does in two years, and it wouldn't take all the books in all the world. Well, that's a little like, mm, are you exaggerating here? Until you realize that this verse isn't just about Jesus when he was alive a couple thousand years ago. It's also about you when you walk out your front door, and me when I walk out mine. 
and what we're going to do as we serve in this coming week because we represent him. So when it says all the books and all the world could not record what he accomplished, it's because it's including your life accomplishments and mine and everyone else's because we represent him. So may you be moved by what he did when he washed feet. May this impact you on a soul level deeply. May we model our lives so that they be lowly and serving like his was. And intimate in our relationships. May you go boldly out your front door to serve in spite of who he is, who you are, and what it is you're going to accomplish. But may you know that when you leave your front door, you are the representation of Jesus to people who you might be their only representation. So go boldly, move with intentionality, love deeply, love wastefully. There'll be people who, who you know, who, okay, great, 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 and move on. And you love them anyway because you're going out your front door as a representation and extension, serving your neighbor like he did of Jesus Christ. So I invite you now to go boldly. Thank you.